and he is going to be talking about using iNaturalist for understanding the distribution and conservation. Welcome. Yeah, how's everybody doing tonight? Good. Good. And where's the camera of the people at home? There's two of them. Here and there. Here and there. You're standing there, you're in one arm. Okay. And the other one's up here. So, okay. so if you want to walk around, it's okay. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, welcome for those of you that are at home. Um, so tonight, um, first of all, I think the last time I talked to this group was in uh, when I worked at the state park over at Guadalupe. So it's been a while since I've been here talking to you all. So it's nice to be back. Um, what I want to try to do tonight is talk a little bit about iNaturalist. I'm not going to go into a full on uh, lesson on how to use it. I'm going to give you kind of a broad overview. How many of you are familiar with iNaturalist? And how many of you use it with you regularly, let's say? Okay. Okay, very good. Well, it is a, it is a pretty powerful tool. And as you're going to find out tonight, it's used um, the data from iNaturalist is used all over the world in a lot of different ways. And then just talk a little bit about some of our, uh, how using it can help document not only the common native plants that you see up here, but, but a lot of our rarer plants that are found throughout the state of Texas as well. So uh, hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy the presentation. The, the first thing I should tell you is that I do work for Texas Parks and Wildlife. I work for what's known as the Wildlife Diversity Program, and more specifically, uh, the Community Stewardship and Engagement Program, which includes Texas Nature Trackers. I'm glad I don't have to put all of that on a business card. Um, but basically, what I, I, I um, what we do is we try to engage uh, the citizens of Texas in citizen science and getting them out, documenting nature for us. Um, and not only are you learning when you're doing that for your own self, but um, one of the things that I like to tell people is that. Um, every county in, in Texas, most every county in Texas has one wildlife biologist. Uh, we have one plant specialist, rare plant specialist. Um, we have one ornithologist. We have, you know, we've got all these onesies. And uh, they can't do everything to monitor our natural resources. So that's where citizen science can really pay off in terms of contributions and using that tool that's pretty handy. Uh, uh, iNaturalist can be uh, great benefit in terms of, of uh, documenting a lot of things that we otherwise can't get documented and, and thus don't have a good understanding, especially of distribution of some of those things, both plants and animals. And without that good background knowledge of how things are doing, it's hard to do conservation or make conservation decisions uh, based on incomplete data sets. And that's one of the challenges we always have uh, with that sort of information, whether it's golden cheek warblers or whether it's uh, Tobush uh, 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 fish of cactus. So uh, I work with uh, one other person, uh, Wendy Anderson. She works out of Austin. I work out of Bernie. Um, and uh, if you ever get a chance to have her come present, she's completely awesome. She is a plant person of, uh, as well. Um, so she's a she's a great teammate to, to be able to work with. We cover the entire state of Texas. I've got the south half of Texas. She has the north half of Texas. So. Um, we get to be on the road uh, quite a bit, <laughs> and get it, which I don't mind. I actually like it. So I, I kept trying to beg for the panhandle because I love going up there, but she wouldn't give that up. So I'll, I'll take I'll take Big Ben. Oh, take the Chihuahua Desert. That's not that's not, I, I can live. Uh, but anyway, so our program, as I mentioned, we use iNaturalist as a tool to engage the citizens of Texas. Um, and the idea is that if we can get people engaged to going out and documenting the plants, the native plants and animals, Texas, we can then go and mine that data and pull important information out and then share that information with the, the, the researchers and the uh, conservation community, whether it's with Texas Parks and Wildlife or other people. Um, and then also what we do in order to enhance that we have a series of iNaturalist projects on our webpage um, that track the specific species. We're specifically interested in species conservation need. We'll get to that in just a second. And a lot of that data that we are able to vet 
that's got good photo, photograph quality, um, good information about it. We can get into what's known as the Texas Natural Diversity Database. And that's where we house all of that information on uh, whether it's uncommon or rare plant communities, whether it's bridge, bridges that host uh, Mexican free tail bats, rare plants, rare animals, that kind of information. So what is an SGCN or species of greatest conservation need? It's basically a native plant or animal that is declining or rare and in need of, of, of attention uh, to recover it or to keep it from, I was, I got to change that on every presentation, prevent, not present, um, the, this is what happens when you have 15 versions of this, this program and you update it, it, you never catch the yes and prevent. Um, the need to list under state or federal regulations. So these are three examples right here of, of uh, Edwards Plateau uh, uh, SGCN, a uh, plateau milk vine, which looks an awful lot like um, much more common pearl milkweed, uh, except it doesn't have the pearl in the center. And of course, scarlet leather flower, a, a beautiful vine, perennial vine, and then toe bush fish hook cactus, which there looks huge, but it's actually a cactus about that big around. So you can imagine wandering around the landscape uh, in the Edwards Plateau trying to find a cactus that time <laughs> without stepping on it and smashing it, same process. So those are the kinds of plants we're looking for. Um, in Texas, um, we have just plants alone. We have 432 species that are considered species of greatest conservation need. Uh, we have 43 species that are state threatened or endangered. And we have 35 of those are actually also listed as federally threatened or endangered. And there is a database where you can go and find out about this information. Um, uh, and basically the way they rank them, they have what's known as a, a global rank and a state rank. And it ranges from five to one, five being very common and not in need of, uh, nobody's worrying about that, to three, to there's four and then there's three, and they start monitoring when it hits a three, that's, those are vulnerable species. And then when it gets to a two and one, then we get to be critically in, uh, a rare. Uh, and then a lot of those are the ones that get ranked as endangered. Um, and when it says G rank, that's global. Uh, and, and an S rank is the, a Texas rank that we have. You can go to those state Texas, uh, uh, state wildlife action plan for Texas which just was published recently, there you'll find a link that will list all of the SGCN for all of the different plant and animal groups that are out there uh, and learn about what we do to try to make sure that these species don't disappear from the landscape. Um, very important document. In fact, that document helps us get our federal funding uh, for work with uh, mostly wildlife. Plant life we have to get state funding for because the feds don't um, have funds for plant um, plant research work for state funding. Um, so iNaturalist, by the way, was not something invented by Texas Parks and Wildlife. We did try to have our own app once iNaturalist came out. Uh, they poured $50,000 into the app and it worked uh, very well not, but not. Uh, it was much harder to use. Uh, and then the first time Windows updated, it was defunct and uh, thus done. So we turned it uh, specifically and stayed with iNatural. It's a lesson learned. Uh, but basically, it's an online social network of people just sharing biodiversity information. It was actually created by some college students in California. Uh, their two uh, goals were to connect people to nature and then to generate scientifically valuable biodiversity data from users uh, in their personal encounters with nature and then share that information. And um, this this was invented back at the time when Facebook was becoming popular and <laughs> couldn't open up Facebook without somebody going, here's a, here's the dinner we're having at the restaurant tonight, or here's my new pair of tennis shoes, or uh, they, they they went a little bit of beyond that sort of thing and thought much on a much higher level, which has been really tremendously successful. And basically, the way it works for those of you that aren't as familiar with it. Um, you download an app on your phone, you create an account, you go out and take a picture, and now you can record a sound as well. And you share it with the rest of iNaturalist users out there. And if you don't know what it is, 
Hopefully somebody finds it and will help you identify what you are looking at. Uh, the good news about iNationalist is it has a pretty good um, artificial intelligence component to it. So I think I just went to a presentation where they said there's like 200 and, and my number's off a little bit, 220,000 roughly species of plant, plants and animals globally now that have enough repetitions of the photographs to make it smart, the, the app smart enough to be pretty good at identifying positive. But keep in mind, it doesn't identify everything. Um, a lot of it has to do with picture quality. Um, I'm shocked how many people take blurry pictures on, put it on iNaturalist. Um, I don't know if that means they need a new eye test or what it's about. Um, you got to have good quality pictures to get a good quality eye. Uh, globally, uh, this was a few days ago, but it's past 200 million observations globally, um, which is pretty impressive when you think about it. That's a lot of data, a lot of information contributed by just people that are out exploring nature. So pretty, pretty impressive. So why iNaturalist? Why, why do, does Texas work on it so high, um, so much? First of all, it emphasizes community engagement. It's an open science platform, so everybody has access to the data. It focuses on peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and reveals how local areas fit into the larger picture. And I, I always think about this um, since I've gotten on board with this several years ago. I wish I'd had this available to me when I was a kid because uh, I was a nature kid and, and uh, I didn't have anybody to mentor me or you know help me figure out what the, what the heck anything was other than wild kingdom. And, uh, and he was usually in Africa or India or someplace like that, not, not in a cornfield in Southwest Iowa. So um, there's a lot, and, and the encyclopedias were always out of date as soon as you got the, dish, the new A or B or C. Um, so, so it's a really valuable tool for us to learn about what we have around here. The other thing that's really amazing, I think is amazing, is that between 2020 and 2023, this, these percentages are the number of records that went into what's known as GBIF or the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. This is kind of a storage house for global observations and information about plants and animals across the globe. And you can see that 63% of mammals observations came from iNaturalist all the way up to 81% of reptiles. The reason birds aren't on there is simply because we have Eva, which is, you know, pretty good app. However, what's really, it's notice 62% of the plants that are documented in GBIF are now coming from iNaturalist. Uh, one of the differences between eBird and iNaturalist is with iNaturalist, you're required to have some kind of physical evidence of what you're, what you're saying you saw. So that's either got to be a good photograph or it's got to be a sound. Um, with eBird, all they're doing is trusting a bunch of bird watchers to, that know that, that they're positively identifying birds. And being a bird watcher, I've turned some really strange things into birds before. <laughs> um, so I know that I can say that uh, I've been a bird watcher since I was a little kid, and uh, mistakes were made over the years. Just for that. Uh, but a very, very valuable tool for scientists and for the general public. And of course, who's using it? Um, there are thousands, literally thousands of peer-reviewed uh, 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 research scientific papers now that rely on iNaturalist data. Almost every state in the country is relying on iNaturalist data. Uh, books are being published using iNaturalist data. So it, it gets a ton of use by everybody that's in the conservation community. Uh, again, very, very valuable for that, those purposes. And uh, back in 2013, uh, which uh, predates me in this program, uh, Texas Nature Track started to work with iNaturalist, and that was back when it was only 8 million observations. And as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, now it's over 200 million. So it's grown a little bit. Um, and so we have been using it since that amount of time. And uh, doing a count this morning, this morning, we are closing in on a million observations here in Texas, just within our projects. There's actually a way more observations in Texas, uh, but just in our 12 projects, we've had closing in on a million. Of those, about 75,000 are species of greatest conservation need, the observations of individual species. 
Um, and so we're, we're gathering a lot of information that we literally would not gather otherwise. If this weren't available to us, all of that information would, we, we, we would know. Uh, we would know about it. Um, we've also taken a lot of our reptile and amphibian observations and put it into the Texas Natural Diversity Database because there is no funding in Texas Parks and Wildlife specifically for reptiles and amphibians. And um, as a result, iNaturalist becomes a very, very important source of data. And of course, we've also downloaded data from Mammals in Texas Project, Texas Whooper Watch, and the Texas Eagle Nest uh, have all got data that has gone into the TXMDB. Um, as of uh, not too many days ago, Texas passed 10 million observations just in the state. So you can imagine if an organization like TPWD looked at 10 million observations. Now, granted, there's a lot of white-tailed deer in there, a lot of northern cardinals, candy lion. Uh, we're not too worried about them, but out of that 10 million plus, uh, there is a lot of information that's useful for conservation purposes. We uh, uh, do have our own website where you can go and check out the projects, join the ones that you're interested in. Um, and then uh, we also do an event called City Nature Challenge. Maybe some of you have participated in that in the past. It's a spring event, a global spring event. Um, and um, this is what our projects are right now. We're getting ready to retire a few of those because they've served their usefulness at this point. Um, but the one that we are maintaining, one of the ones we're maintaining is our Rare Plants of Texas project. Uh, you'll notice it only has 2,000 737 observations, which shouldn't be that surprising because, well, they're rare plants. Uh, and a lot of them are really rare plants. Um, and that's why the focus is, is on that. Um, and the numbers are small. The other thing with rare plants, a lot of times the really rare ones, uh, they look so similar to the ones that aren't rare that are uh, that it's really hard to identify by photographs unless you have really good quality photos. So one of the things I'll be emphasizing tonight is that when you're, if you're doing plants um, uh, on iNaturalist, you want to take more than one picture. Uh, if you take a picture of a sunflower, uh, as we all know, uh, a lot of those sunflowers look like the other sunflowers, and uh, it's hard to identify. So with rare plants, this is hard. So um, in terms of for Texans specifically, it again provides an important tool for identifying what's around us. Um, and, and I think that's important because um, I've been doing this kind of work for 40 some years now. And there are days where I wonder if anything that I've ever done made any difference at all to the, to the health of the environment. And that's because a lot of people are, have got blinders on, go through the world, they never notice anything around them. Um, and, and, uh, and then we ask those same people, would you give us money to support conservation? Uh, or that kind of thing. And if they don't really care, why would they give you money? For that? Why would they support conservation? So um, my life mission is to get people engaged in the outdoors and caring about it because real conservation doesn't happen until you have people that uh, care and want to learn more and do more for the natural. Um, it also um, gives us, again, as I've already said two or three times, ways to actually track uh, plants and animals across the landscape. Um, and then the other thing I think is valuable to at least some of you in this audience is if you have grandkids or kids uh, or great grandkids, it's a great tool uh, to get out and get them interested in, in the natural world. And I don't know, I don't know a kid that doesn't want to sell someone as soon as they can walk. So uh, just want to put it to good use, right? Instead of just playing video games on it. Uh, I might be biased. A few of the things that we use iNaturalist for, this is, uh, if you look on the left, those are the classic distribution maps of the pronghorn, the West Texas and the panhandle. But iNaturalist records, when you go and search those out, you start to find records that are outside of those zones of known distribution. So this helps contribute new information about the distribution of some of our plants and animals across the state that we might not otherwise have readily available to us. Another thing, one of the weirdest things I think I've ever seen, the nine actual thing, as I was watching a commission meeting a couple of years ago, and the uh, small game um, biologist came on and said, uh, 
They were looking for some proposed changes to squirrel hunting in the state of Texas. Uh, and they used iNaturalist records to figure out if there were if the if the numbers of squirrels were getting this is one way they did it uh, were getting high enough in other counties that they could actually open up more squirrel hunting opportunities. So it's actually being used as a management tool uh, in that example. Uh, another example is during our city nature challenge where we invite everybody across the landscape to get out and take pictures for four days. Uh, if we calculated that in 2020. There were 84 community scientists to every one wildlife biologist in that four-day period. So you can imagine the amount of data to be collected by 84 people over four days, then by one biologist. Uh, so it, again, very powerful tool. The other thing I naturalist in Texas is being used for is actually just collecting information for city officials and county officials and other entities that are trying to figure out is what's going on on their on our pieces of property. Um, for example, in, in this particular example, there was a park that uh, they had in um, uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and they had a small piece of ground that they, the, the city city or county people were debating as to whether they should maintain it or keep it or whether they're going to do this property. And Sam Keishman, the guy up on the left, one of our urban biologists, um, went to them and showed them this map. And these are all IA naturalist observations in that area. So what it did, A, is it showed a great amount of diversity of plant and animal life. It also showed a whole lot of people are using that property. So it makes them kind of gives them an idea of whether that find out that that's actually pretty um, a pretty good place for people and people are using it and enjoying it. So in terms of collecting the data, there are different ways of going around it or uh, to do it. You can go to a, through a project like ours. The tricky part with our projects is you have to go in and, and join them. And then you have to physically submit the observation to that selected project. So it's a little bit harder to do, but it gives us data that we can't get from a regular project. And thus we have to go that route. You can participate in a bio blitz. For example, starting on October 11th this year, um, is our annual uh, Texas pollinator bioblitz where we're asking people to go out over that two and a half week period and take pictures of native plants and the pollinators that are visiting them. Um, we get a lot of observations from the general public, a lot of excitement about that uh, effort. You can actually then create projects that are very site specific. So, for example, Headwaters of the Comal has a project. We've had over almost 15,000 observations, and I've been there. It's not that big an area, so that means a lot of people are contributing things and over 1,400 species of plants and animals. So if you ever visit, if you take somebody to take Edwards to Mao and make your first visit, uh, there's a lot of diversity in it. Nice and small problems. You can also do taxa-specific projects like we do at Guadalupe River State Park with the butterfly survey we've been doing now for nine years. Uh, we not only collect data by walking around, collect data that way, but and photographs taken and put on the project, which helps us document by with proof that we've seen the species we say we're seeing. And then finally, if you want to get really personal, you can create your own project for your own property. This is a project that I started when we bought our house in Bernie a few years ago. Uh, planted a lot of native plants, got rid of all the non natives for the most part. And uh, you can see that we're up to 640 species in a yard that uh, the front yard is probably 25 by 30. Backyard's probably not much bigger than that in terms of feet, not yards. Um, and uh, the diversity we've got there. And that's one of the things. With something like iNaturalist, and I, I, when I talk to I talk to a lot of NIPSAP groups and other places, and people are wanting to put in native plants. And as you all know, we've got this great seed, seed project that's fantastic. Um, one of the things that I've always tried to encourage people to do is if you're going to put in native plants, don't just walk away and say your job's done. If you're going to put in native plants, why don't you follow up and see who's coming visiting? You know, are there new birds coming to the yard to feed on the new insects that are coming to your yard? What kind of butterfly species or bees or wasps or other things like that? So it's a great way to just spend some time in your yard, developing more of an intimate relationship with your yard and actually 
finding out is all of that work to put in those native plants, is it actually paying off? Does it make a difference? And it's kind of fun when you go, it does. So then talking about iNaturalist a little bit and using it, um, when you take a picture with iNaturalist to record a sound, you're creating what's essentially a digital voucher. So what you're doing is saying, this species was here at this time, this date, on this uh, uh, at this location. And all of those different colors, by the way, represent different taxa. So green would be plants, and I think blue is birds, and uh, or red is one of the two. Uh, but it gives you an idea of where something is on the landscape at, at that time. That doesn't mean it stays there, but it certainly gives us a current record of what's going on. And what's nice about that is over time, you can go back uh, if people continue to record or document, you go. You can go back and say, okay, is, are these plants still here? Are these animals still here? Um, or you see a, a rare plant botanist sees a plant and they go and they confirm that it's that and it's in a new place, they can go out and hopefully be able to investigate if there's a new population for them. So when you download the app, you open the phone, the, the iPhone's on the right, the uh, Android's on the left, it's going to look like this, it's going to have your observations, and then it's going to have buttons so you can take and upload some new data. We're going to run through this. Um, basically, when you click on that button, you're going to get this screen where you get these choices. Now, if you're using this on an uh, iPhone, on an Android, you'll also be able to have a fifth option, which is sound recording that you can pull in a sound library on your phone. Basically, you can document something without a photograph but it will never get to be what's known as uh, uh, research grade. We'll talk about that in a little bit uh, because there's no physical evidence of what it is. So nobody's going to come on and go, okay, I'll believe you that you had a whooping grant standing in your front yard. Um, chances are that's probably not going to happen. So you're not going to get much benefit out of that. Again, you can record sound. I always recommend that. And of course, we're talking plants. So uh, I don't think my naturalist can tell whether it's a cottonwood blowing in the wind or a... Or Cedar L, but um, you can record. I always tell people to record for at least 15 seconds, especially if it's a bird or a frog or a toad. You have no idea what it is. Um, inevitably, what happens is you turn on record, and what happens? The animal stops singing, right? So you're just going to leave it on long enough so it'll hopefully start up again. Now, you can also go to your, your photo library. So if you've got a bunch of pictures in your camera, you want to start adding them to iNaturalist, you can do so by clicking on camera roll, you go in, you select picture you want to upload, that, hit add, and then you can process it through. It takes a very short period of time. Have kind of a fun way to do it. I like using this sometimes when I'm doing plants, especially because instead of using iNaturalist, the camera with iNaturalist app, I actually use my regular camera because I can edit, I can zoom it in a little better focus it a little better depending on my camera that I'm using, my cell phone that I'm using. Um, and so then it gets into the library, then I can go and pull that whatever I want. Now, if you go ahead and take a uh, picture, you're going to get it logged in up there. You can go and take more pictures, and especially if it's planned, I'm always going to encourage people to take more than one photograph, particularly if you don't really know what it is. Um, but when you get done with that, you hit that plus button, it'll take you back to your camera, you take, open it back up, get another picture. Um, when you get that done and you're ready to go, all you have to do is click on what did you see? It's going to give you suggestions. This is one of the things with iNaturalist. It doesn't tell you that's exactly what it is. It's this based on our artificial intelligence. We think that this is what it is. And then it'll give you a series of choices most of the time as well. So all you can do is pick the best choice that you think it is. If you have no clue, put something there. Put the very first choice. Maybe it's a genus or a family. Put that so that it's kind of a placeholder so that people will that are interested in helping you with that identification will look at it. If you leave it blank, a lot of times people just ignore it. And then you can, uh, the, the date and time are already stamped on there. So that's important, good information. Location is very important. Particularly accuracy. Sorry. What I've learned since I stopped working in the park, I don't talk as much. My voice doesn't work as much. 
But the accuracy is important for us, for our observations from the Texas Natural Diversity Database. We want to have those objects in 500 meters. It's beyond that, it's really getting too far away to be of any value in terms of a specific location. There is captive and cultivated. Um, if it's a wild thing, this is defaulted to uh, wild. It says no, so you can just leave it. You can actually add it to projects uh, that you've joined. Very easy to do. Uh, I am going to talk about geo privacy in just a minute because that's a big deal for a lot of people. And then uh, when you're ready to go, you hit share and it uploads it right to the into iNaturals. Now, in terms of that geo privacy, the default is open, which means that when you put something on iNaturalist, the location, specific location data is going to be there on a map. Okay. So it's going to tell you exactly where you saw it within whatever accuracy you have there. But if you have something, let's say you take a picture of a rare plant, um, especially a cactus. Um, a lot of our cactus, rare cactus in Texas, are actually already set up in iNaturalist to be blocked so that if, if you can see where you got it, but the general public can't because there's so many people digging cactus in particular, selling them on illegally, um, that kind of thing. So. Uh, you can protect that actual location while still sharing the observation. You can set it to obscure, which means it draws a 22 by 22 kilometer. Don't ask me why they pick 22 kilometers, it's random. Uh, box around that observation with a random point in. So you'd have to work pretty hard to figure out where that thing is within that 22 by 22 kilometer. Or you can click on private, and on the map it shows nothing. So you can completely protect it. So let's say you go out in your property and find a Texas tortoise. You share it to a Herps of Texas project because that'd be important information, but you can make it private so that the general public can't actually see the real location. All right. And in terms of those projects I mentioned, you can you can uh, when you join projects, uh, they're gonna fall if you click on projects, you're gonna see the projects you've joined or you are a part of. Um, Projects like our projects have a little um, uh, toggle switch here. You actually have to select that toggle to get it to go into that project. That's the appropriate one. The rest of these projects are generic projects that as long as you take a picture within the boundary of that um, observation, it's automatically going to upload into the project if it's the right type of text. Does that make sense to everybody? Another thing to keep in mind is that um, iNaturalist, as I mentioned uh, before, is giving you suggestions. So what do you all think you have up here in this picture? Um, uh, actually, black vultures. That, that they are buzzards, or my grandpa always called them buzzards. Those happen to be blacks. Um, and I'm guessing iNaturalist, when it did the interpretation of that image, put black vulture as its first choice. But its other choices included those. <laughs> and uh, the bear, bear. So I love the fact that they put American bison. I mean, bison are fans of wild boar and American bison. Um, those are definitely not mammals. <laughs> so uh, kind of crazy. I had a first time I ever taught an nine nationalist workshop, I had a lady take a picture of a shelf fungus on a body log. First choice that came up was River Rock. <laughs> I should have taken a picture of that screenshot of that. Say, so. uh, now let's think about uh, if you're going to go out, you're going to take pictures of plants. Um, and I've talked with our rare plant botanist a lot about this. And one of the biggest challenges with rare plants or any plants is getting the characteristics you need to identify the plant. So what I tell people is, I want you to think like a taxonomic key. Um, and, and if you haven't used a taxonomic key in a while, basically you open up a, a flora book and it's got choice 1A is, is, uh, is it an evergreen? Choice 1B, is it deciduous? You pick your choice and you go to the next thing and it has a couple of the choices and you work your way through, down through it. And it uses a variety of characteristics. It uses flowers, it uses the leaves, it uses the arrangement of the leaves. It uses whether it's hairy or not, what the shape of the leaves are, all kinds of things. So when I got, when I, especially when I find a plant I do not know, um, uh, and there are so many plants, as you all know, in Texas that you'll never find a field guide that has it. 
Um, if you do, that would be a miracle uh, and very expensive, I'm guessing. Um, so what I'll do is make sure I get a picture of the of the of the uh, flowers. I get a picture of the entire plant. I'll make sure I get a picture of the leaves. That's a starting point. A minimum of three pictures. If it has seeds, I'll do that. If it's got other things, I'll do that as well. The idea is that even if my naturalist can't get it to a species, if I've got this collection of photographs and I put it in a plant project, there'll be people in that project that will help me identify what that species is based on those numbers of pictures. The other thing to keep in mind is I naturalist, when you take, if this is your first picture, this is the only one it's going to look at for identification. But you can change the picture that it's using to ID it. Then use all three of them together. You can change that picture in your observation. And I've done that before where I get this, I don't get a satisfactory answer. Change it to this, I don't get a satisfactory answer. Then I change it to this being the first photograph. And then all of a sudden it gives me an answer and I can look at and compare the photographs of the species. And I might be able to get the answer that I can choose. So would it say Homo sapien? Uh, no, but, you, but I'll tell you what, if you take a picture of somebody on iNaturalist, it is going to say that. Just be it out. Uh, and by the way, you yeah, have the hand thing. So I use my hand in a lot of these pictures because, hey, I'm not framing them and hanging them on a wall. I just want to know what they are. My hand gives me some, gives me some scale. Yes, exactly. So I, I think that can be really valuable once later on. So when you uh, also you can do close-ups because a lot, as you know, if you've done plant identification, details matter with plant identification. We throw a little picture of that little lens thing there called a Zenbo. Now, of course, cell phones are so bloody good. You don't need it, but you can get really close. That's a high quality little device I carry in the field a lot. I get really close. Here's a gallium. We all know gallium flowers aren't that big. Um, so that helps. There's a Cedar. Uh, and then these are the flowers. This is a little flower cluster from spice bush. Um, very tiny flowers. Same thing with chickweed up there. You can get details on the seeds and grasses or even the hairiness of a leaf. All of those details can sometimes be important. Leaf arrangement is really important. Uh, again, thinking like a taxonomic key, especially with woody plants where the leaves opposite one another, where the leaves are paired at the node. Or are they alternate on the stem, taking one at a time on each node? Um, that can be very valuable. Okay, now I'm going to give you a quiz. Random quiz. What's the leaf arrangement on uh, button bush? Anybody know? Opposite. Opposite to what? Each other. Yeah, but there's actually a lot of times there's three leaves, so they're called whorl. Um, so sometimes, that's a good answer though. Got an officer. That's a good start. So sometimes you have more than two leaves on there, and that's the reason I brought that up. So well done. Um, you need to know whether the leaves are compound or not compound. So a typical compound leaf is called pinnately compound, like on uh, evergreen sumac. You're going to have palmately compound, where all of the leaflets come off one point on the on the stalk, the tail, or you can have bipinnately compound. So here's a compound leaf, but it's got its, its leaflets are also compound. So again, that's important information. Uh, if you were to just walk up and take a picture of this right here, that wouldn't do very good for iNaturalist identification. It's just kind of what is that? This one right here, is cat claw, and this is Virginia creeper. So, and does everybody know where the, how to figure out if you've got a compound or a simple leaf? I know you do. Okay. Wherever you find the bud on a woody plant, that's the that's where the leaf is attached, right below it. So then you go out on the on the petiole, and is it is the leaf just one big mass like you see here on the maple, or is it divided up into all these little segments? So if you look here, you would not find a bud. If you looked at the base of it, you would find a bud at the base of that, and that tells you whether you've got compound. So, for example, pecan trees are compound leaves. Mexican buckeyes are compound leaves. You can also look at the shape of the leaf. Is it is it lobed, and how is it lobed? You have two different oaks there. You've got um, a big tooth maple right here. Just those those little things can be important. One thing to remember with oak trees is that they're incredibly variable, leaf to leaf. 
So again, having a picture of sometimes you may need multiple leaves in the photograph to help you. The venation, how the veins are arranged on the plant. You can either have typical pinnate veins where you've got one main vein and all of the other veins branch off of that one. This happens to be a dogwood. They have those rounded uh, paired veins. This is also a really cool plant. If you, if you want to know if you have a dogwood, take one leaf and just gently pull it apart in the center and the veins will stick together and you'll see it get white stringy stuff. When you do that with any other leaf, they don't, they just snap off. Sure. Rough leaf dogwood, yeah. And then you've got here a typical of um, a um, cloak up there. And then you can have, when you have palmate leaf, just like we had palmate leaflets, you can have palmate veins where more than one vein erupts from the base of the of the flat of the leaf. Here you've got three on hackberry, and then here you've got multiple five of them. It looks like uh, on the uh, uh, is that a net leaf hackberry? Right. Uh, yes. Yeah. So those things can be important. And when I take pictures, most of the time, if I'm doing veins, I do it on the underside because the veins show up better than most. And then again, whether it, is it an entire leaf, no teeth, no lobes, or is it double tooth like on most elms, or does it have uh, regular te teeth like you see right there? So all of those are. And then of course, uh, don't forget if you find fruit, take advantage of that, or you find flowers on it, take advantage of that. Again, the more information you provide for iNationalist users to help you with the identification, the better off you're going to be. And then finally, are there any stem modifications? Are there prickles or thorns? Are there tendrils? Uh, if it's a binding plant, all of that can be valuable information. And then finally, what's really amazing with iNationalist is I took pictures of these two and just threw them on there, and that's the only thing I gave it. Identified both trees correctly. So, I mean, it's got some power. It's got some power. Um, of course, this is a Texas person, and that happens to be a live one. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, sometimes when you take a picture of a plant, you find more than just the plant. You see those little rows of dots? Anybody knows what, what caused those? Steps on them? Yellow belly steps. Yeah. Well, I should say saps up. <laughs> Probably a yellow belly um, But it could have been anything. Saps, you can watch it. So then one of the nice things is you start taking pictures and you're putting things in iNaturalist, and now you want to go and look at what you've got. Well, every, when you create an iNaturalist account, you get your own web page on iNaturalist. It has all of your observations. So this is where you can go and really do a lot. It's on the web page. So this is what a typical web page is going to look like. Across the top, there are all kinds of drop-down menus that you can utilize. Red arrow points to menu because behind the menu is where you find help. And they've got great tools for helping you. They've got tutorial videos. They've got a forum where you can ask questions if you're wondering what's, what, what's going on. Fantastic place. Um, so that's important. And then if you look up there, it says explore under that red uh, rectangle. You can go in there and you can actually explore for any species on Earth that you want to know about. Uh, and it'll pull up all of its observations. So if I was going to travel like in January, theoretically, I'm getting on a plane and, and sadly having to fly for 15 hours to go see my children, one of my child, children and grandchildren in uh, New Zealand. Uh, I mean, it'll be neat when I'm there. It's, it's, it's drug me for the 15 hours. <laughs> um, but I can go there and go, okay, I want to go. And I, one of the things I want to do while I'm there, besides seeing the grandkids, of course, um, <laughs> When we're out hiking, I want to be able to take pictures of butterflies. And I want to know what the butterflies are there. I can go and look for a project on New Zealand butterflies, and I already have. And I can get the list of what I might see. But when I get there, I'll be a little smarter about what I'm looking at, birds or whatever topic. So I naturally can help you with your, your explorations. There's that help guide. And then under your name, there's going to be a lot of drop downs as well. Um, there's everything from uh, if you open the calendar, it's going to show you when you made your observations for each day of the year when you did it. Okay, you can edit observations by clicking on here. Um, you can look at different lists. You can journal. 
Uh, but the big three, here's your profile page right here where you can upload a photograph. Um, here's your observation link. Here's your IDs. This is where you might say you have an expertise in, in, in some group of wildflowers. You can go ahead and help others identify theirs by looking for pictures that have not been identified. And then this is where your projects are listed as well. So you can go into all of that. You open up observations. You can display them as a map with all the little orange dots. Or you can display them as a list right here, or you can have these little um, pictures so you can kind of preview them. One thing that you'll notice on a lot of your observations is it has this little RG there in a, in a green box. That RG means research grade. And basically what that means, when we do our, uh, when we go into our data and are looking at observations that we might be able to use, one of our first things that we look for is, is it research grade? And what that means is that two thirds of the people that have, have confirmed that observation agree that that's what it is. So when you got two thirds of the people, that means it goes to research grade. That means it's gonna be generally trusted that the identification is correct. Most people on iNaturalist, in fact, everyone I've ever seen, they don't go in there and go, yeah, those are birds. I don't know why you're calling them bats. Um, because their name is associated with the ID, so you don't want to you know, ruin your reputation. <laughs> well, uh, but, it, but that's an important classification for us as one of the keys that we're using to figure out what, what's going on. So iNaturalist is great for a lot of different things, but it doesn't do everything. Uh, it measures species richness. It's telling scientists and everybody else, hey, this thing was here at this date and time. It doesn't measure population numbers, health. It obviously doesn't measure absence. The phone app is a data collection tool. A place where you can really explore iNaturalist is on the web page. A lot of people don't use the web page. It's too bad because there's all kinds of things you can do. Another neat thing about the web page is if I'm building a presentation and I need a picture of something and I don't have one, I can go to iNaturalist and search for it. And as long as the copyright stuff says I can use it, I can put it in my uh, presentation, give a photo credit, I'm good to go. There's not and a lot of times if you went to the web and did that. You might find your picture, but there'd be some kind of watermark across the middle of it because they want you to pay for it. I naturally want that, again, that community effort. Uh, some people guard all their photos, but a lot of them don't. I should also mention the Seek app. Um, the Seek app is actually downloaded five to eight times more than the iNaturalist app because you don't have to have an account. It's designed for kids under the age of 13, so they don't have to have an account, no privacy issues. You can upload your images from iNaturalist, from C to iNaturalist. Um, iNaturalist uses the same artificial intelligence where Seek does as iNaturalist does. Um, but there are certain limitations to it, a, a little bit less uh, robust. But it's a great app. Yeah. The nice thing about Seek is you take it, you point it at the object, and it starts to tell you what it is right away. So that's good. Kind of and by the way, I just want to mention too, a lot, a lot of these phones now have like plant ID built in apps that they'll tell you the thing, which is great. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't contribute any of that information to science or understand. It's a kind of a personal tool to help you identify something. But if you want to contribute, uh, you need to use an app like that. Okay. Yes. You mentioned uh, some California students. Uh, <laughs> Is there now some corporation or nonprofit that brings one of the guys that gains it? Two of the guys that created it are still working with it, and they are now a, a, a 501c3. So they went, they were, had sponsors, California Academy of Sciences, and somebody a couple of other sponsors. The National Geographic was a sponsor, but now they've gone ahead and formed their own 501c3. So, for example, I give 10 bucks a month for the Thai Nationals because I use it so much. I just make a personal donation. So they accept donations to kind of keep them going, and they have to go out and find grants and things like that. But Scott Laurie, who was one of the students that invented it, is still widely, he's, he's known globally about how this works and everything. And they keep, they're getting ready to actually roll out a new version of iNaturalist, the app. Now they're testing it right now. 
And uh, sometime in September, they're doing a soft launch. And then eventually it'll be rolled out on most styles of phones. And I don't know what those changes are going to be. It'll be interesting. But supposedly it'll be an even better version. Don't they always say that about every app? Yes. How often does that act? Sure. So I wanted to also talk about rare plants in Texas because there are not many protections for rare plants in Texas uh, or anywhere else for that matter. Um, first of all, prohibited acts of, uh, of the Endangered Species Act for plants. So if you have a rare or endangered plant that's listed, uh, it's illegal to import, export, or sell without a permit. Okay, It's illegal to remove or possess them from uh, or destroy the plants on federal areas, obviously, same thing with state state areas. Um, it's illegal to damage or destroy on private lands with a federal nexus. So let's say you're a landowner, a rancher, and you've got a, you've got got some funding through Texas Parks and Wildlife through a federal wildlife grant, and you're and you're applying that money to your property, and you've got a rare plant or animal there. One of the things you can't do is go and destroy those. Or you're you're federal you're violating federal for rare and endangered plants and animals. Developers are not required to mitigate. That's one of the biggest challenges we have. The developer developer can go in and do whatever the heck they want, and I'm not bad now than developers because uh, we're most of us are living in houses built by developers. Um, um, but what a lot of times happens is the, if some if this is again this is why having that information is important. Because the developer is going to find a piece of land, and they're not going to know there are rare plants or animals on there unless somebody in the past has done some logging or done some surveys. A lot of them, not all, but a lot of them will work with that to either take those plants and move them to another a, another location or somehow try to protect them if possible. Um, but they, they're not required. And again, there's little or no regulatory burden for private landowners. So if you have an endangered species, on your property, you discover that you do. Uh, if you want to go out and destroy it because you don't want the government messing with you, go for it. If you want to help cause the extinction of something, you go ahead and do that just fine. I will tell you that I've worked with the TXMDD and I've asked them, I'm doing a big bat project where we're surveying bats across the state on private lands. And in order to share the data, we have to have a waiver that says we can share the data, which includes the address, but in all the years, the 20 years this guy's been working on the database, he's never had one request from anybody in the public for the addresses of anybody that's had data contributed on it. So this, most people are out there going, okay, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to see who's got a red bat, and then I'm going to sneak on their property because I want to steal the red bat. It doesn't happen. But paranoia uh, is, uh, uh, is real, so we have to be very careful with that. In closing, all plants matter, just like all wildlife matter. They don't get the protections that wildlife do. Um, there are efforts to try to change that. Uh, uh, because bottom line is, if we don't have plants, we don't have us. So, and, and I was talking to our rare, bot, our rare plant botanist, and I said, I said, you need to help me answer a question. And I said, she goes, what is it? And she goes, uh, She's a wonderful lady. She says, uh, I said, um, somebody asked me, why, why does that rare, rare plant matter? She goes, well, then why do you as a human matter? Yes. She goes, That's not the answer I give, but um, bottom line is all of these, we may not understand what they're there for or what they're good for or anything like that. But I always tell people, if they're there, they're on this earth, they have a purpose whether we understand it or not. And I think we, as the species that lords over everything, it seems like, have a, re a responsibility to take care of us. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, when you play Jenga, you know, you're sliding those, you just never quite know when the thing's going to fall. It's kind of like with plants or other animals, but especially with plants. You never know when the disappearance of that animal is going to trigger cascade other events that cause uh, local extinctions of other things. And one of the biggest things that they're working on now, especially in the insect world, uh, are pollinators and the decline of pollinators across the globe. 
Uh, the problem with that is we don't know a lot about our, a lot of our pollinators. A lot of our bees are, you know, a few millimeters long, and most of us have never seen them in our life, including a lot of scientists. They may be pollinating a plant that we just don't know about. That plant disappears. Does that insect disappear? Or does that insect also pollinate three other kinds of plants? And because it gets a local extension, what happens to the things that it also used to visit? And the other thing to keep in mind for, and the reason I advocate to keep taking pictures, is because just because something is common today doesn't mean 50 years from now it's going to be common. We all know development right here in Comal County. What was it, a couple of years ago? This was the second fastest growing developing county in the in the country, I believe it was. Um, so a lot of your landscapes here are disappearing at a, an alarming rate. Um, so with that, go plant species, go animal species. Um, so again, having a knowledge of where these things are on the landscape currently and into the future can help us down the road on another generation when they're trying to figure out what happened, where they might stay. So with that, I'll take any questions you have. Uh, that little thing up there, don't take a picture of that. But that is a scan thing that the feds have asked us to do to prove that we actually go out and talk to people so we can continue to get our funding. That's the one you want to take a picture. It's a voluntary, it's basically male, female, for us to take the thing. If you, if you want to do that, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But I'm required to at least give you the option. Question on the chat? Yes. Says you might want to explain checking culture plants with photographing the garden. So, oh, sure. Yes, we can do that. Now, I, if I heard you right, it was so you're taking a picture of a plant in your garden, how to, how to log it. That's what Tim like, cultivated it a while. So, that's one of the challenges, especially with native plants we're putting in our yards. Um, so, I, I put about 160 species of native plants in my yard with the years. Uh, not all of them have survived. Uh, um, when I go and take a picture of them, I always, on that, on that when you, you can say captive or cultivated, I put cultivated because I put it there. Uh, before I bought that house, those plants were nowhere near where they are now. So those are, even though they're native, they're cultivated. The, the key becomes when after I've been there five or 10 years, and all of a sudden I look in my neighbor's yard and there's one of my plants, which is, of course, my goal is to have my plants bleed into their grassy lawn and maybe it'll survive my wing and flower. And they'll go, it's really pretty, I'll say. Um, uh, we had a poke weed grow up in the bowl of a live oak in, in the neighbor's yard. That came from a bird that ate a poke weed seed from our yard. But basically what happens is if you, if, you, if you plant those things and all of a sudden a few years ago, now you see that plant outside where you planted it, is it wild or is it cultivated? Well, if you were observant enough and you go, well, that plant wasn't anywhere near here when I started this project, the chances that that plant was carried in by a bird or you know, blown in by the wind um, it could have happened, but we don't know. So that's when you get into that gray area. And, and if I have a doubt, I'll go ahead and put cultivated in that situation. But let's say you go to the botanical, the LBJ botanical garden, and you're taking pictures there. And in the garden, fixed garden beds, there's the plants you're taking pictures of. You get out on one of the trails, and all of a sudden, there's the same plant growing out along the edge of the woods or in one of the little prairies. You could go ahead and list that as a wild plant. You'll never know, right? You take a recreated prairie where they take a prairie and they turn it, they renovate it, and they add a bunch of seeds. Are those native or not native? Are they wild or cultivated? Uh, at some point, you just have to kind of make your own decision, smartest decision. Um, I'll give you a perfect example of one that really causes a lot of confusion is red yucca. It's only native to two counties in Texas, but it's planted all over, right? Um, but it's only native to those two counties. So like we're doing our work with that plant, we're only gonna focus on the presence of those plants in two counties, okay? 
Um, it is very easy when you're out taking pictures to forget to check cultivate. So you kind of have to just kind of do that the best. Hopefully that answers. So, yeah. Um, so I have painted spacing in from kill that. Oh. You don't tell anybody. <laughs> I mean, so here's, here's I one that said there was a difference between animals. Yeah, I mean, one about Texas. well, they have more protections because they're animals and because there's more regulations involved. Plants just don't get the recognition for, for protections. And a lot of it has to do with funding, frankly. Uh, but when I was a wildlife biologist from Kumal in Kendall County, I had landowners I'd go visit. One of the first things out of their mouth was, do not tell me if you hear a golden cedar warp, because if you do, I'm going to go clear all the cedar trees in my property. Because of that parent, and I'm going to call it, but I think it's paranoia that the government going to come and take my land. Okay. I think if I were one of those landowners, I and somebody told me I had a what Texas wildlife comes out and goes, hey, you know, you got a population of gold seed workers. I'd be going, awesome. Because that means I'm taking care of that land well enough to host an endangered species. What's wrong with it? That's my opinion. Um, and so I think we've got it twisted completely backwards, where people revile having rare plants or animals on their property instead of celebrating that. And I don't know how you turn that that switch and flip it the other way. I've been trying for a long time. I find that it probably falls on deaf ears. We have our biases. <laughs> and you too. Yes. Here's an iNaturalist question okay. about repetition. Is it important to, you know, especially if you have species that are wild on your property, to re record them at certain intervals? Or I mean, it's up to you. It's completely up to you. There's no rules or regs on how to do that. What I do is I'm, I'm, I'm big into phenology, which is studying of when things appear when they flower, when they go to seed, when they die back, or when birds are migrating through. So every year in my garden, I'll go through it. And when the first uh, large buttercup balloons, I'm going to take a picture of it. Even though I've taken that same picture of that same plant for five years, I'm going to take a picture of it because at some point I may want to look to see if they're blooming at different times of the year. If they started early this year because we've got a bunch of rain over the winter, or maybe they didn't even flower. You know, that kind of thing. So it's more for my personal use of it, if you will. Um, but collecting data in the wild over the years as more and more people visit and they're all taking pictures and they don't know who they are, each other it is. But you accumulate enough data, all of a sudden you can say, for example, let's take the Texas tortoise. So somebody, uh, there's, there's a park, for example, and there's Texas tortoises on it. People are taking pictures over the years. And, you know, the... One year you get five pictures of it, the next year you get 15 pictures of Texas. You don't know which one it is, right? But over time, you could go back and say, hey, how are Texas tortoises appear to be doing at that location? So you can kind of do a rough monitoring of that. Um, but again, I, I use it because of phenology. And the other thing I do is I take a lot of pictures of pollinators in my yard because I want, again, you know, uh, three years ago, I had so many different species of wasps in my yard. It was amazing. I had no idea there were that, that many different kinds of really cool wasps. And just before you start going, well, why would you care about wasps? Every species feeds on some kind of insect that, as, an, as a larva, that are mostly pests to us. Wasps are great alternatives to spraying chemicals because they go and look for caterpillars and grubs under the ground. There's a, there's a wasp, at least one species, more than one, that can actually walk around on the ground, somehow sense that there's a June bug grub under the, under the soil, dig down, dig down through the soil, find it, lay, sting it to paralyze it, lay an egg, crawl back out, and that larva will grow there and then know when it's ready to go that it can crawl out of the ground, fly away, and go do the next next generation. That's the kind of stuff that's going on out there that you don't realize. Well, that three years ago, I had them all over the yard. And the reason I think I did is because I had snow on the mountain all over in my garden. 
it just kind of came. I, I think I planted a few and, you know, selling them out, go crazy. Uh, but it's an annual, so it's, and, and most annuals come in, go crazy, and then eventually die off. And I had wasps everywhere. I don't have any different species. I, I can't recall right now. It's on my project. And then one day I looked out my window in my garden and there was a family of summer tanagers in my garden. And you know what they're eating? Every bloody wasp I had in my yard. <laughs> and then the next year I didn't have quite as many snow in the mountains, which they love. The nectar source on them, they love them. Fair. Um, love is such a human word. I shouldn't probably use it, but they use a lot. The number of plants went down. My number of species of wasps have not recovered since. And I don't know if that's an evolution of the garden or and if they'll come back. That's why I, I, I'm out there all the time documenting because I want to see, it's kind of like our butterfly surveys. I want to see, you know, do the numbers vary year to year, month to month? How, why is that? That kind of thing. So there's, a, again, a lot of information you can get out of using iNaturalist over time. So I, I say, oh, why not? Why not? Yes. Uh, does I naturalist have some, or maybe it does? Uh, I'm looking to identify a spider I saw yesterday. I've never seen it before. So I'm it. Yes, if you can get a picture, try to get a picture of the top of it, not the underside. Um, and it's pretty good about identifying a lot of spiders. At least gets you to a, an idea of what group of spiders. There's also a brand new field guide on the spiders in North America. It's spectacular. It's about that thick. Yeah. Yeah. So use iNatural as first. <laughs> I, speaking to that, I'm a big collector of books, nature books. So I've got field guides. I've got, I've been, I finally started cataloging in books in my, in my, in our library at the at home. And uh, I'm up to three, over 300 books. And I've only done the insect and plant books. Um, and I've got, a, I've got six shelves of bird books. So I've got a ways to go. But so when I say I'm a collector of nature books, I really am. Um, but when I use iNaturalist, a lot of times I'll use it and give me an idea of what it is. Then I can go later if I if I don't, you know, I don't know for sure. I can go find one of my field guides and see if it's in there to get confirmation. I do that a lot with moths, especially moths and spiders are two big groups. But if you can get a good and get a clear picture, that's the tricky part, is to get it in focus. This guy did not hide from me. He was He's right out. ready to defend himself. Oh, well, there you go. Very much. There you go. And remember, most of those spiders we see are girls. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. And yes, they will try to defend themselves if they need. Any other questions? Yes. Chip County is with Red Oh, man. Oh, it's it's out. Out. It's it's terrible. Terrible. It might be Tim. Not you. Terrible. No. What, uh, the Chihuahua Desert. So out by the Big Bend area. So I, it's not even Terrell County. It's farther west than that. There's only like four counties in the Big Bend region, but two of those counties out there. So then it's native. All right. I hope that was okay. And that presentation's on this computer, so you can just run away or whatever. Thanks.